Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're dis delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this very interesting less series, as far as I'm concerned, is entitled Three Cosmic Messages. Now, if you're familiar with Adventism and know about the emphasis that Seventh-day Adventists have placed on the Book of Revelation, you probably guess that this is talking about the Three Angels' Messages of Revelation 14. And this particular lesson, lesson number eight, from May 20th, 2023, is entitled, The Sabbath and the End. Hmm, that must have something to do with the final conflict, huh? Let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, we have come into your presence today to try to understand more clearly some of the issues, one of the main issues, perhaps, in the final conflicts which are coming, we hope very soon in the future. Help us to understand those issues clearly as our prayer in Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm. Do we really believe as if we, and act as if we believe that we are all brothers and sisters descended from a common ancestor, namely God, Jim? From the Bible study guide, the essence of humanity's dignity is a common creation. The fact that we are uniquely created by God places value on every human being. The unborn in the mother's womb, the quadriplegic teenager, the young adult the de with Down syndrome, the Alzheimer-afflicted grandmother all have immense value to God. God is their father. They are his sons and daughters. God, who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands. He has made, he has made from one blood every nation of men of, to dwell on all of the face of the earth. Acts 17, verses 24 to 26 from the New King James Version. Okay, I'm going to interrupt now. Um, I heard one time, it was back in the days when they were really just first trying to figure out how the spiral helix worked, our, our DNA and so forth, and they tried to figure out how much we are related as beings. And someone claimed, and I don't know whether this is true, I'm just repeating what I was told, that if you could go seven or eight generations back, you could find a link to every other person in the world. That seems a little far stretched to me, but um, that was what was claimed. Okay, you wanna go ahead, Jim? Ours is a shared heritage. We belong to the same family. We are brothers and sisters fashioned, shaped, and molded by the same God. Creation provided a true sense of self-worth. When the genes and chromosomes come together to form the unique biological structure of our personality, God threw, God threw away the pattern. There is no one else like you in all of the universe. You are unique, a one-of-a-kind creation, a being of such immense value that the God who created the cosmos took upon himself our fleshly bodies and offered himself as a sacrifice for you and your sins. Now, I would, would take exception to that last phrase there, but anyway, that's for yeah, that's Bible more. study guide for May 13. Yeah. If one carefully thinks of the implications of evolution as compared to our divine creation, the contrasts are incredible. What does incredible mean? Believable. Impossible to believe, right? The fact that God tells us that there, were, there will be a judgment at the end implies that we have some responsibility. It wouldn't be fair to judge somebody for something about over something about which they had no responsibility, right? Carrie? If we are merely a collection of randomly formed cells, simply the product of chance and an advanced African ape, nothing more, then life has little meaning. If we are merely one of estimated eight billion people clawing at one another for living space on a planet called Earth, life loses its purpose. Other than mere survival, and in contrast, the Bible creation provides a reason to live and a moral imperative for living. 
We have been created by God and are accountable for Him for our actions. The one in a, a, a big O there. The one, yeah, that's the, it's capitalized because it's referring to God. Yes, who made us holds, holds us res responsible. He has established absolutes even in a world of moral relativism. Yeah. The head of Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide for Sunday, May 14. Okay, and what do we mean by moral relativism? Any all you wizards with understanding the latest things going on in our world? Moral relativism means morals float around which way you want. Yeah, it, it it's it's it well it means it means what's what's good for me may not be the same as what's good for you. What's bad for me may not be the same as what's bad for me. And then the fool says, "What? That's your truth, but I got a truth. Yeah. Uh, truth is truth. It isn't yeah. subject to debate." Yeah. <laughs> now we may not understand it the same way, and it, we clearly don't interpret but it all the same. Is true. But the truth is the and truth. Jesus' mission was to bear witness to the truth in his yeah. words to uh, Paul or to, yeah. to Pilate, rather. Excuse me. Okay, so. <laughs> Gordon? Revelation 14, 12. This calls for endurance on the part of God's people, those who obey God's commandments and are faithful to Jesus from the Good News Bible. Okay, this verse tells us that we are going to be evaluated based on God's commandments and instructions. God's ways are considered to be light, while Satan's misrepresentations are darkness. The judgment will be based on whether or not we choose God's light. And Jesus himself explained that in, in very good detail, I think. Myra? John three seventeen to 21. For God did not send his son into the world to be its judge, but to be its savior. Those who believe in the son are not judged, but those who do not believe have already been judged because they have not believed in God's only son. This is how the judgment works. The light has come into the world, but people love the darkness rather than the light because their deeds are evil. All those who do evil things hate the light and will not come out into, will not come to the light because they do not want their evil deeds to be shown, shown up. But those who do what is true come to the light in order that the light may show that what they did was in obedience to God. Good news, wow. Bible. So, if your behavior is transparent, you're doing what's good, and it's clear that that's what the case, you don't worry about the judgment. But we have this because of there's so much, I, I think partly because there's so much legal stuff goes on in the public, you know, the public television and radio and all that kind of stuff. We have the idea that if judgment's happening, somebody is going to be condemned. We don't have judgments to, to, to prove who's the good, who are the good people. We have judgments in this worth. We have judgments to prove some, who somebody has done something wrong, right? So judgment tends to have a negative impact or implication. Uh, we're going to find out that it's not always that way in God's kingdom. So God is holding us responsible for obedience and faith. Revelation 14, 7, our first, well, our second verse in the three angels' messages, he said in a loud voice, honor God, praise his greatness, for the time has come for him to judge. Worship him who made heaven, earth, sea, and the springs of waters. And I will tell you that... Uh, as we'll see a little bit later, uh, the time has come for him to judge. The way the he, the Greek is written there, it could be, it could mean the way has the time has come for him to judge us, or it could mean the time has come for us to judge him. Time of God's judgment is what it says in the Greek. So it could be either way. Romans fourteen ten. You then who eat only vegetables, why do you pass judgment on others? And you who eat anything, why do you despise other believers? All of us will stand before God to be judged by him, not just about vegetables. <laughs> you want to pick up there, James? 
I'm sorry, Big James up there. Jim? Okay. James, read to us about James. James, uh, chapter 2, verses 8 to 13. You will be doing the right thing if you obey the law of the kingdom, which is found in the scripture. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. But if you treat people according to their outward appearance, you are guilty of sin, and the law condemns you for you as a lawbreaker. Whoever breaks one commandment is guilty of breaking them all. For the same one who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not commit murder. Even if you do commit adultery, you have do become... Do not commit adultery. Do not commit adultery. You have become a lawbreaker. If you commit murder, people and, excuse me, speak. speak and act as people who will be judged by the law that sets us free. For God w will not show mercy when he judges the person who has not been merciful, but simply but mercy triumphs over judgment. Good news, Bible. Okay. So notice what it says there. Speak and act as people who will be judged by the law that does what? Condemns us? Sets us free. Sets us free. God's judgment is for the purpose of setting free those who are his faithful followers, right? We will escape from this sinful world. If we were simply the result of a long evolutionary process, we could not be held responsible in any way for our behavior. I mean, you know. However, God has created us and given us the freedom to make choices. Thus, we are responsible for the decisions we make. God expects us to make those choices in light of not just this world's history, but also in light of all of eternity. And it, that, in order to get that, you have to be educated. Mm -hmm. Education is a process. Yeah, you have to, and you have to understand. In other words, the the full scope of this whole thing, which is way bigger than our little planet here. And you have and people. And it doesn't say, come overnight. Yeah. yeah. If people say, "Oh, you got to get look within," no, you have to be educated from without. Yeah. Uh, and you have to look out too. Yeah. <laughs> Heredity and environment are two major forces impacting who we are and how we live. But these factors need not be overwhelming. Some people say, well, well, you know the old the traditional, thing, traditional things that some people said, the devil made me do it, right? We can still choose to do right because it is right. What relationship do heredity and environment have to the choices we make daily? How can we, by God's grace, overcome character defects that we didn't choose to have in the first place? I mean, if we're just completely random creatures that happen because of evolution, we can't be held responsible for what we're doing. Okay, Ellen White comments about that. Here's mine, is it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Those who put their trust in Christ are not to be enslaved by any hereditary or cultivated habit or tendency. Instead of being held in bondage to the lower nature, they are to rule every appetite and passion. God has not left us to battle with evil in our own finite strength. Whatever may be our inherited or cultivated tendencies to wrong, we can overcome through the power that he is ready to impart. That's from Ellen White, Ministry of Healing. Wow. In light of last week's lesson, which said that by beholding we become changed, how might this happen? If we're filling our minds full of good things, what will be the result? Good will come out, right? If we fill our minds full of trash, what's going to come out? Trash, right? The book of Daniel was written about 540 B.C. At least that, that was when it's finished. Uh, some of the stories were, took place earlier. And the book of Revelation about 90 A.D. 90. So how, how far? That's over 600 years difference, right? Did God understand what would happen in 1844 when he gave Daniel that 2300-day-year prophecy? Did God already know that in 1844 Charles Darwin would write his book on evolution? Remember that it was not published until 1859, but it was written in 1844. In 1844, what else happened in 1844? That's important to Adventists. Begin the judgment. The, yeah, the, the great disappointment, and then the beginning of the pre-Advent judgment. 
We all should honor and worship God because of his creation, his offer of salvation, his healing, and his final restoration. The Sabbath is a central part in that entire history. From the first order of creation to keep the Sabbath down until we are told that we will keep it throughout eternity with God and his new earth, the Sabbath has been and will be a mark of our loyalty to God. I once heard someone talk about the Sabbath and he said, well, God's faithful people kept the Sabbath in the Garden of Eden. God's faithful people kept the Sabbath to the Old Testament. God's faithful people we know are going to keep it when they come, when the new earth is formed and down there. So why would God change to worshiping on Sunday for this one gap in the middle of that whole process? Just an interesting little argument. Seems unlikely. Seems unlikely. The fact that we worship on the seventh-day Sabbath is acknowledgement and evidence of the fact we believe in a fiat creation. What does fiat creation mean? Just arbitrary, just... Uh, oh, no, I don't like the word arbitrary. Fiat means you speak something and it happens. It, yeah, yeah. 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 You just command it and it happens. Which took place in seven literal 24-hour days, and then on the seventh day, he created the Sabbath for us to worship and fellowship with him. Okay? Genesis 2, verses 1 through 3. And so the whole universe was completed. By the seventh day, God finished what he had been doing and stopped working. He blessed the seventh day and set it apart as a special day because by that day, he had completed his creation and stopped working. Okay. I've heard lots of people say, well, the Sabbath is was given at Sinai, it's for the Jews nope. only. Nope. No, it was given to Adam and Eve. And what did Moses himself at Sinai say about why we have the Sabbath? Well, Exodus 20, verses 8 to 11 says, Observe the Sabbath and keep it holy. You have six days in which to do your work. Sometimes it seems like we need more. <laughs> but on yeah. the seventh day is a day of rest dedicated to me. And on that day, no one is to work, neither you, your children, your slaves, your animals, nor the foreigners who live in your country. In six days, I, the Lord, made the earth, the sky, the sea, and everything in them. But on the seventh day, I rested. That is why I, the Lord, blessed the Sabbath and made it holy. Okay, now there's a, what might appear to be a contradictory statement about what was said there on Mount Sinai. I found in Deuteronomy 5. Listen to these words carefully. Observe the Sabbath and keep it holy as I, the Lord your God, have commanded you. You have six days in which to do your work, but the seventh day is a day of rest dedicated to me. By the way, do we need that Sabbath? Absolutely. On that day, no one is to work, neither you, your children, your slaves, and sometimes our children sometimes think they are the slaves, <laughs> your, your animals, nor the foreigners who live in your country. Your slaves must rest just as you do. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt and that I, the Lord your God, rescued you by my great power and strength. That is why I command you to observe the Sabbath. So, Gordon, it was just for the Jews, right? Nope. Well, that's what it sounds like here. God is giving additional meanings to the Sabbath. Okay, as, he's adding as meaning. Several have been added since then. Yes, not, he hasn't taken any away, he's just adding. In Ezekiel's day, God told him, in Ezekiel 20, we're going to read verses 12 and 20. I wish we had time to read the whole chapter. I made the keeping of the Sabbath a sign of the agreement between us to remind them that I, the Lord, make them holy. So when we say make somebody holy, what, what is that process called? To be set aside. Sanctified. Set aside, sanctified, made holy. Make the Sabbath a holy day in verse 20 so that it will be a sign of the covenant we made. The agreement, it said in, in verse 12, now it's called a covenant we made and will remind you that I am the Lord your God. Jim, you want to take that Bible study guide passage there. Make the Sabbath a holy day so that it will be a, a sign 
of the covenant we made and will remind you that I am the Lord your God. Good News Bible. From the Bible Study Guide, Scripture calls us to rest in His love and care each Sabbath. Sabbath is a symbol of rest, not work, of grace, not legalism, of assurance, not condemnation, of depending upon Him, not upon ourselves. Each Sabbath we, pre we rejoice in His goodness and praise Him for salvation that can be found only in Christ, from the Bible Study Guide for May 15. What does it say? The Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Right, that Jesus himself said that, didn't yes. he? Yeah. The Sabbath is a rest day, a day of worship and fellowship with God that links humanity, at least those who honestly worship God, from the time of creation to the third coming and the eternal future. That's what I was trying to mention earlier. And here are the verses to support that. Want to read those two from uh, for us, or three, I guess, there, uh, Carrie? Yes. Isaiah 65, verse 17. The Lord says, I am making a new earth and a new heavens. The events of the past will completely, no, will be completely forgotten. From the Good News Bible, Revelation 21, chapter, and in verse 1. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. The first heaven and the first earth disappeared and the sea vanished. From the Good News Bible. Isaiah chapter 66, verse 23. On every new moon festival and every Sabbath, people of every nation will come to worship me here in Jerusalem, says the Lord. Again from the Good News Bible. So the Lord says we're going to do what in the New Jerusalem? Worship on every Sabbath. Worship on every Sabbath. And on the new moon festivals? Well, the new moon festivals uh, had a variety of meanings for the Jews, and I don't, we've never studied that very much, at least I don't know anybody who studied it very much, to know how that might apply to the, uh, the, new, the new kingdom. The Sabbath helps us to realize that we were intended by God to be part of something much larger than our human families, cultures, and ideals. Wow. The Bible Study Guide for Monday. The Sabbath calls us back to our roots. It's a link to our family of origin. The Sabbath has been observed continuously since time began. It is an unbroken connection back through time to our creation. It helps us it keeps us focused on the glorious truth that we are children of God. It calls us to an intimate, close relationship with Him. From our Bible study guide for Monday. So let's think about that for a moment. You remember, if you're of my age, you remember a very famous movie series that came out, a lengthy movie that was often played in parts, called Roots. And it was a wonderful thing. It, I, I thought it was great. It was about African-American heritage and so forth. But often we humans in this time and age, we tend to think, well, I'm tied to my roots and you're tied to your roots and you're tied to your roots. So that's why we're different. Well, there's some truth to that, obviously. But what is this verse telling? What are these passages telling us? We need to trace our roots all the way back to say, we all have the same roots, right? We're Not God. I'm different and you're different and we're different because of, no, we have a common root. Okay? Um, in, in, from the Bible study guide also, it says, in an attempt to destroy the uniqueness of our creation, the devil has introduced a not-so-subtle counterfeit. <laughs> yeah. The counterfeit accepted by even some among us goes like this. God is the prime cause of creation. But he took long ages to bring life into existence. Evolution is, a process, is the process he used. This approach attempts to harmonize scientific data. Notice with, that's in quote there. Yes. With the Genesis account, it asserts that the days of creation were long, indefinite periods of time, and that life on Earth is billions of years old. Bible study guide for yeah. Tuesday, May 16. 
Well, what does the Bible say about that? Psalms 33, 6 and 9, which I'm sure many of you, are like me, memorized when you were back in primary school. The Lord created the heavens by his command, the sun, moon, and stars by his spoken word. When he spoke, the word was created. That's what we mean when we say fiat. When he spoke, the world was created. At his command, everything appeared. And our Bible study guide goes on to say, the first chapter of Genesis affirms that God created the world in six literal days of 24 hours and rested on the seventh. The linguistic structure of Genesis 1 and 2 does not permit anything else. Even scholars who don't believe in the literal six-day creation acknowledge that the author's intent, the author's intent, was to teach the six-day creation from our Bible study guide for Tuesday. Jim, you want to pick up there with 11, Hebrews 11.3? Hebrews 11, three. It is by faith that we understand that the universe was created by God's word so that we can see what, so what we can see was made out of what cannot be seen from the Good News Bible. The Bible study guide says the Hebrew word for day in Genesis 1 is yom. Throughout the Bible, every time a number modifies the word yom it, as an adjective, third day, first day, and so on, it limits the time period to 24 hours. Without exception, it is always a 24-hour period from the Bible study guide for May 16. And that's generally accepted by all Hebrew scholars. I mean, there's, there really isn't any question about that. The Sabbath is no arbitrary demand placed upon us by God. It is a memorial, a time to celebrate with God, remembering where we came from and where we are going. Carrie? Also, and to the immediate point, if God did not create the world in six little days, what significance does the seventh-day Sabbath have? Why would God command it? It would make absolutely no sense at all to leave the Sabbath as an eternal legacy of a six-day creation week if a six-day creation week never existed to begin with. Right. To accept long ages of creation is to challenge the very need for the seventh-day Sabbath. It also raises serious questions regarding the integrity of Scripture. By attacking the Sabbath, Satan is challenging the very heart of God's authority. On purpose, I might add. Uh -huh. And what could be more effective in destroying the memorial of the six-day creation than denying the reality of the six-day creation? No wonder so many people, including Christians, ignore the Seventh-day Sabbath. What a setup for the final deception. As from that old... Sabbath School Bible Study for Tuesday, May 16. So for thousands of years, beginning in heaven, Satan has done everything that he could or can to destroy God's influence and the peace of the universe, and he's still doing it. Revelation 12, 7 through 12. So let's look back to see how it all started, okay? Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, who fought back with his angels. But the dragon was defeated, and he and his angels were not allowed to stay in heaven any longer. Is that what defeated means, is they had to leave? Or was there a literal battle? Yeah. The huge dragon was thrown out, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan that deceived the whole world. He was thrown down to earth, and all his angels with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now God's salvation has come. Now God has shown his power as king. Now his Messiah has shown his authority. For the one who stood before our God and accused our brothers and sisters day and night, that is Satan, has been thrown out of heaven. Our brothers and sisters won the victory over him by the blood of the Lamb, by the truth which they proclaimed and they were willing to give up their lives and die. And so be glad, you heavens, and all you that live there. But how terrible for the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you, and he is filled with rage because he knows that he has only a little time left. Wow. Good News Bible. The great controversy did not start on this earth. It started in heaven. 
However, it was won by Jesus Christ taking human nature and living that sinless life and dying that awful second death separated from his father. It was, and that happened here on this earth. Uh, it was finally, it will finally be finished after the third coming when God shall cleanse this earth to make it his eternal home. How could we not honor God after learning all of this? Revelation 14 calls on us to worship God, not to worship the devil or the beast. Well, devil, who is the beast? We are called to faithfully keep the commandments of God and remain faithful to Jesus. It's interesting to note that in these verses in the last book of the Bible, we are reminded of what happened back in the first few verses of the Bible. Bible Study Guide says, The real issue in the last days is our love and loyalty to Jesus. But according to the Bible, this love is expressed in obedience to the commandments. Referring to 1 John 5, 3 and Revelation 14, 12. And the Sabbath alone among the commandments is behind everything because it alone points to God as creator. No wonder it will be the outward symbol of the final divide between those who worship the Lord and those who worship the beast. Considering how basic and fundamental the Sabbath is to everything else, it's hard to see how the final issue of worshiping the creator could not be about anything else. Could be about anything else. Could be about anything else. Many people argue that it makes no difference what day one keeps as a Sabbath, as long as we keep one. How do we answer the, uh, that argument with the Bible? Okay, so how are we gonna answer that with the Bible? From the Bible? We're told to worship the Sabbath because? It's a memorial of creation. Okay. One. God delivered us mm -hmm. from, from uh, slavery, slavery mm -hmm. us from slavery to sin, the Hebrews from slavery in Egypt. Mm -hmm. So it's a, and Jesus rested, rested not only after on creation, Sabbath. but in his tomb on Sabbath, didn't he? he refreshed. Oh. What? In uh, Exodus, he says he was rested and was refreshed. Yes, exactly. So none of those things are memorialized by any other day. So the day you worship on is not just a case of this 24 hours versus that 24 hours. It's a question of what the 24 hours means. What is this associated with it? Now, Christians will say, well, we worship on Sunday because we're celebrating the resurrection which is fine. Jesus gave us something else to celebrate the resurrection, the Lord's Supper. That's to celebrate the resurrection, see? And he said, drink this as a memorial to me until he come, until I come back. So, um, I, and from biblically, a biblical standpoint, the people who worship on Sunday, Sunday only, um, have a pretty thin case, in my opinion. It's not a based of, not a memorial of creation. It is a pagan, uh, with all the meanings associated with Sunday, a sin worship, mm -hmm. and all the Mithraism and all that sort of stuff that goes with it. It has so too much baggage, to it doesn't point to the Creator. No. If the great controversy were just over an arbitrary command to worship on a certain day and not any other, that would be true. If God just says, well, I want you to worship on Wednesday. Okay, you say so. That would be one thing. But God gives us multiplied reasons for worshiping on the Sabbath. But the Sabbath has so many meanings attached to it that to refuse to worship on that day is to reject God's entire plan of salvation. Where are we? Was it mine? Yeah. I think it's, uh, I didn't get it. Yeah. From the Bible study God, the Sabbath is a place of refuge in, every, in a weary world. Each week we leave the cares of this world and enter God's retreat center, which is the Sabbath. The famed Jewish author, Abraham Joshua Heschel, calls the Sabbath a palace in time. Hmm. The Sabbath is meaning for modern 
man. Uh, each seventh day, God's heavenly place descends. Palace. Hal, excuse me, heavenly palace descends from heaven to, to earth, and the Lord invites us to the glory of His presence for this twenty-four hour period to spend a time of intimate fellowship with Him. Okay, I have a question for you. If the president or some king or something like that that you respected and honored very much invited you to spend a day with him, you would say, well, I don't really have time for that. You put the qualifier in there, some of the respect, because yeah, I yeah. can't think of uh, many yeah. that would qualify. Yeah, well, that's why I said what I did. But anybody, it wouldn't have to be president or a king. It could be someone really important to you that you respect and says, come, I want to spend a day with you. We'd say, well, yeah. Man. No, we would, we would rush over there. Um, we, we have a privilege coming up, uh, my, my wife and I, to attend a very important graduation ceremony for someone that we respect. And what do you think we said when they said, we, this person said, I have two seats remaining. I uh, so invited two or three family members, but I have two seats remaining. I would like you to come. You think we would say, oh, no, that's too much trouble. <laughs> what, what's going on here? Check my calendar. Yeah, check my calendar. Yeah. I might be busy that week. <laughs> yeah. I might arrange to be busy there. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, in the introduction to Heschel, Heschel's book on the beauty and solemnity of the Sabbath, Susanna Heschel, his daughter, writes of the significance of the Sabbath in these words. The Sabbath is a metaphor for paradise and a testimony to God's presence. In our prayers, we anticipate a messianic era that will be a Sabbath. And each Shabbat, which is the Hebrew word for Sabbath, prepares us for that experience. Unless one learns how to relish the taste of Sabbath, one will be unable to enjoy the taste of eternity in the world to come. That's in the introduction to his book. If you could find, had the uh, Hebrew interlinear uh, with the English and Hebrew, remember the Sabbath for making holy of him. Mm -hmm. Because it's, 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 for, it's for the benefit of man. To, to, yeah. It's a time that you're not required to do any work. Or the, and it's a special. I think Heschel, they, it, it, the, the, like the first day of the week is the first day toward the Sabbath or something. Yeah, that, that's, the, that's the way the Hebrews number. And, yeah. and that, was, that was, well, they rearranged it a little bit. The Muslims have, have arranged it so that it ends up on Friday. Yeah. 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 So... And so, the, to the Muslim world, the first, the first day of the week is Sabbath, what we call Sabbath Saturday. The second day of the week is Sunday, and, other, and then, of course, Friday is their worship day. It's a wonderful thing to realize that the God who created our perfect world in the beginning will do it again at the end. You know, get rid of all the disease, the sin, all the pollution and corruption, and et cetera, et cetera, and make a wonderful new world. And we will continue to worship God every Sabbath. And we have again our Isaiah 66, 23 verse, in case you've forgotten it. Okay, it's Gary. Every new moon festival and every Sabbath, people of every nation will come to worship me here in Jerusalem, says the Lord. That's from the Good News Bible. We live in a world full of anxiety and despair, even depression. I'm doing a research project now, and every one of the things, we're, we're, we're giving people medicine to help them lose weight. But one of the things we have to ask them, have you ever had anxiety or depression? Because maybe these medicines, we don't know for sure, but maybe this new medicine we're trying might have some impact on that. And we, we certainly wouldn't want someone to take the medicine and go out and commit suicide. The answer is to, to that is to realize that we are supposed to be a part of God's glorious plan to restore everything to its original condition. Revelation 4.11 tells us that all of heaven rejoices because God is our creator. How do they feel about that? Our Lord and our God, you are worthy to receive glory, honor, and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were given existence and life. From the Good News Bible. Okay, and then Exodus 20, verse 11, that we already looked at before, but just to review. 
In six days I, the Lord, made the earth, the sky, the sea, and everything in them. But on the seventh day I rested. That is why I, the Lord, blessed the Sabbath and made it holy. Good News Bible. Okay, Myra? Within the Decalogue of the Sabbath commandment stands as its seal in that it identifies who God is, the Creator, confirms the territory over which He rules everything He created, and reveals that He is right to rule, for He created everything. In order for the dragon to succeed, He had, had somehow to set aside this memorial. From Angel Manuel Rodriguez, I'm sorry, the closing of the cosmic conflict role of 30 Angels' message is on public manuscript, which we had already referred to earlier. So think about people who make laws and they stamp them. We're not so much into stamps these days, but if you travel, uh, especially in some of the more, uh, let's say, more official countries, they will have a stamp. And what does that ha stamp have in it? Where, why, when, no. It has the person who's responsible, that would be the state, whatever, the government, whatever, the date, and so God has his seal, his name, where he's ruling over, and what, what right he has to rule over that territory. Okay, many have recognized the fact that the Sabbath and the meanings that God has attached to it answer the great existential questions. And what are the great existential questions? Where do we come from? God created us. I saw an interesting little story from a kid who came home from, I think it was a second grade or something like that, to his mommy's house. He came home to mom and said, Mommy, we learned how to make babies today. And she's panicking out. And she said, so how how you do that? Well, you drop off you, the B-A-B, -B, you drop off the Y and you change it to I-E-S. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Why are we here? And how can we achieve the best good while we are here? We are to learn to be like Him. Where do we go when our lives on this earth are finished? God's plan is for us to join them in the earth made new. We have been told very clearly that Satan will make the keeping or not keeping of the seventh-day Sabbath as a memorial to God, the final test of our loyalty to God and our loyalty or our loyalty, loyalty to Satan. Did we understand, do we understand all those issues? So at the end, if we read carefully, and I would encourage you out there, if you haven't done so recently, Review Revelation 12, the great controversy, where it started and where it's going. Then Revelation 13 is Satan's ideas. Okay, what's he planning to do and why does the whole world seem to be wandering after him? And then you see God's response in Revelation 14. So do we understand these issues? And they're going to be, I mean, it has to, they have to be patently clear, I'm sure. So... I guess that's mine. The fact that there is a judgment implies that human beings can make moral choices. If we merely evolved, there would be no real basis for free will. If everything were determined by our heredity or environment, we would not be capable of exercising our freedom of choice. William Provine, professor of history of biology at Cornell University, acknowledges that evolution and free will are incompatible. In a lecture delivered on February 12, 1998, he made this remarkable state, statement. Naturalistic evolution has clear consequences that Charles Darwin understood perfectly, including the idea that human free will is non-existent. Free will is a disastrous and mean social myth, abstracted from his comment, Evolution, Free Will, and the Punishment and Meaning of Life, uh, talk in February, February 12, 1998. And you can see if you have the handout there, look it up for yourselves. Well, go ahead. I've just done quite a bit, Jim. Free will is certainly not a mean social myth. It is an inalienable gift given by God to each of us 
each one of us. If you do away with free will, there is no way to determine right and wrong. If there is a judgment, there must be a law that is the basis of that judgment from the Bible study guide. For okay, so when we say there must be a law, we might, when we say there must be some way to know what's good and what's bad or what's right, what's wrong, and, and there must be some basis for making that judgment, right? Mm -hmm. Now, if you live in a government where they make the rules, um, by and large, we have to live by those rules. Someone, someone made the rule, but well, God's... Not for us to wonder why, but just to do or die or something yeah, like that. Yeah, that was a charge of the light brigade. Yeah, what it was, okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay, ju just to review again, what, how does the judgment take place? John 3? 17 to 21. For God did not send his Son into the world to be its judge, but to be its Savior. Those who believe in the Son are not judged, but those who do not believe have already been judged, because they have not believed in God's only Son. This is how the judgment works. Light is That should be a clear statement, right? Jesus himself said, this is this how the judgment works. works. Okay, let's see if we can figure it out. The light there, the three lines up, four lines up. Where's my... Uh, the light has come into the world, but the people love the darkness rather than their light, because their deeds are evil. All those who do evil things hate the light and will not come to the light, because they do not want their evil deeds to be shown, uh, shown up. But those who do what is true come to the light in order that the light may show that they did what was in obedience to God. Okay, so, I mean, we understand that. What do small children do when they know they've done something wrong? Do they want to come and tell you about it? Well, they do like Adam and Eve did. <laughs> Get out. <laughs> they Get out. find me here. <laughs> Fig leaves. <laughs> Fig leaves, or whatever yeah. they, whatever they yeah. uh, You probably all had experience of, of kids getting into something and they're all covered with the evidence that, no, I... Yeah. <laughs> chocolate. Yeah, chocolate. Satan will do everything he possibly can to force us to join his side in the great controversy. That's Revelation 13. However, God will never use force. God's government is based on love and force is not appropriate. Gary. Okay, this is from Mrs. White. In the work of redemption, there is no compulsion. No external force is employed. Under the influence of the Spirit of God, man is left free to choose whom he will serve. Let me interrupt for a second. So, we didn't, we didn't get that from evolution. No. Go ahead. In the change that takes place when the soul surrenders to Christ, there is the highest sense of freedom. The expulsion of sin is the act of the soul itself. True, we have no power to free ourselves from Satan's control, but when we desire to be set free from sin and in our great need cry out for power out of and above ourselves, the powers of the soul are imbued with the divine energy of the Holy Spirit, and they obey the dictates of the will in fulfilling the will of God. The only condition upon which the freedom of man is possible is that of becoming one with Christ. The truth shall make you free, and Christ is the truth. Sin contrived only by enfeebling the mind and destroying the liberty of the soul. Subjection to God is restoration to oneself, to the true glory and dignity of man. The divine law to which we are brought into the subjection is the law of liberty. That's from James 2, 3, 12, rather. Ellen G. White, Desire of Ages, page 466. Think of all the laws that we are supposed to obey given to us by uh, the government. Things like pay your taxes and things like speed limits and so all those kinds of things. And we usually think of those things as restrictions, don't we? They're not, we don't think of them as laws of liberty. Now, we understand that if you don't follow the rules of driving on the road, you try to drive on the wrong side, you're going to be in trouble sooner or later, right? 
So we sort of, we understand that there are reasons why we have to have laws, but we still kind of think of them as a little restrictive, don't we? Well, so I find out that those, we call them laws, they're made up by committees or whatever, but then the, the, those that make them up, somebody give exceptions to, to their favorites or themselves. Yeah, there's, there's that not, happens sometimes. Yeah. In fact, surrendering to God and living a life according to His plan for us is the only way to true freedom. Ellen White, again, spells that out. In Desire of Ages 668. One of the most amazing statements in the whole book. All true obedience comes from the heart, and that means the mind. It was heart work or mind work with Christ. And if we consent, he will so identify himself with our thoughts and aims, so blend our hearts and minds into conformity to his will, that when obeying him, we shall be but carrying out our own impulses. In other words, we're going to be changed. Mm -hmm. The will, refined and sanctified, will find its highest delight in doing his service. When we know God as it is our privilege to know him, our life will be a life of continual obedience. Through an appreciation of the character of Christ, through communion with God, sin will become hateful to us. Desire of Ages 668. Think about that. We, we, it'll be high, our highest delight to do His service. We'll be just carrying out our own impulses by obeying God, and sin will become hateful to us. Now, those are the kind of people you would like to live next door to in heaven, right? You pointed out before that that's the highest level of moral development. Yeah. When people ultimately learn to do what's right because it's right, not because of a promise of a reward or yeah. threat of punishment. Yeah, exactly. Remember that the God did not convert, coerce Lucifer or Satan to obey. He did not coerce Adam and Eve to do what he told them to do. He will not coerce, coerce us to obey today. Mrs. White says, before the first coming of, uh, she said this, before the first coming of Jesus, the earth was dark through, through misapprehension of God, that the gloomy shadows might be lightened, that the world might be brought back to God. Satan's deceptive power was to be broken. This could not be done by force. The exercise of force is contrary to the principles of God's government. He desires only the service of love, and love cannot be commanded. It cannot be won by force or authority. Only by love is love awakened. To know God is to love him. His character must be manifest in contrast to the character of Satan. This work, this work only one being in all the universe could do. Only he who knew the height and depth and love of God could make it known. Upon the world's dark night, the sun of righteousness must rise. When sun being not S-O-N, but S-U-N. Yes. With healing in his wings, Malachi 4. So, Jim, what do you always emphasize? What, he's, what did he come to do? Heal us, right? Well, through, through education, really, or demonstration, which is the part of the education. Uh, it's, it's the only, only answer. He, only yeah. he could demonstrate that love. Yeah. yeah. Well, in, in fact, that's, uh, when you understand John 16, he says, I'll send you a comforter. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a being, it was a lesson mm -hmm. of how to conduct yourself, because you're not afraid of dying. It, it, it's a different way of, of understanding John 16. In the devil's final deception, this is from our Bible study guide, he will attempt to coerce God's people to serve him through restricting their ability to buy or sell, through ridicule and slander, through persecution, imprisonment, and even death. Remember that Revelation 13, 15 to 17 says that Satan is going to have the nations actually make a law that all God's people are to be killed. He will pressure them to conform, while Revelation 14, 7 invites us to worship the Creator. Revelation 14, 9 warns, us, warns against the worshiping the beast. The final conflict between good and evil is over worship. From our Bible study guide. Then, in a chaotic, 
uncertain world, the Sabbath is an oasis of peace. It points us to our Creator who gives us the assurance of security and safety in His presence. The Sabbath is a place of refuge, a sanctuary in time that descends from heaven to earth each week. Think about that. A sanctuary comes down from heaven. It's like God says, okay, now, this is my sanctuary. I want you to be a part of it. It unites us in a common bind, bond with our brothers and sisters in Christ. The Sabbath is a great equalizer. Worshiping together on Sabbath, we recognize anew, we understand afresh that we are part of the great web of humanity created by God and that he has made us made of one blood all nations. And for those who've had the privilege of working or even traveling in other parts of the world and meeting with Adventists, uh, you know what, I mean, they're brothers and sisters. You may not be able to talk their language, you may not look like them, uh, they might not understand you, but we're brothers and sisters because we have a common belief. Paul said that in Acts 17, 26. I think we've got about time to read, enough to read that. Who's next? Can't be. <laughs> oh, sorry about that. Uh, Paul said to the people of Athens, from one human being he created all races on earth and made them live throughout the whole earth. He himself fixed beforehand the exact times and the limits of the places where they would live from the Good News Bible. Okay, Gordon, you want to try that in next The Bible one? study guide. In the final days of Earth's history, the world will be brought to a test over the fourth commandment. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. The commandment that leads all humanity to worship the Creator will be substituted by a counterfeit day of worship. We've seen it already. Mm -hmm. Once again, God will have a people who are faithful to Him. Revelation 14, 12 declares, here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and are faithful to Jesus. God's remnant, his last day people, will endure to the end. By God's grace and through his power, they will keep his commandments. From the Adult Teachers Sabbath School Bible Study Guide. Are we ready for this? Will we be able to stand up to the devil no matter what he does? Would we be willing to die for the truth? What truths would you be willing to die for? Think Jesus, about that. That's what Jesus said. Yep. Let's pray. Our Father, what a marvelous experience this lesson has been, teaching us some great points, even about the very, our very existence, thinking about what things are so important to us that we'd be willing to die for them. We thank you for the Sabbath and all that it means to us and all that it represents if we have carefully studied our Bibles and see what God associates with the Sabbath. We thank you for this lesson and for this time together. Forgive us where we have failed you with our prayer in Jesus' name, amen.